My name is Valerie Schultz, and I serve as a communications and outreach associate here at CLC. To start us off this evening, I'm going to just begin with a few housekeeping notes for our shared virtual space today. So please note that everyone is muted and will remain so in order to make sure we don't have any competing background noise. Um, but we do welcome folks to keep their cameras on. I see many of you um, with your screens on tonight. Hello, we'd love to be able to see who is with us. Um, but if for any reason there is issues with connectivity or the quality of the call, we do recommend folks you can turn your cameras off or try moving closer to your router. Um, third, we are hoping for lots of conversation tonight. And the way that we'll be having that conversation is through the Q&A function. Um, the Q&A can be found at the bottom of your screen. And feel free at any point during the presentations tonight to type in a question. We will save all of our questions till the end of the presentation and give Brandon and Pat a chance to share together on any questions you might have. Um, and lastly, um, we will be recording this presentation to share with any of those who aren't able to join us tonight. So again, thank you so much for being here. And I'll begin by reading um, the Columbia Land Conservancy's land acknowledgement. We are on the unceded lands of the Mohican, Lenape, and other Algonquin speaking peoples. CLC recognizes the indigenous history of this land and supports efforts today to build more equitable spaces for all the human and non-human relatives who call this place home. I now have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker this evening, Patrick Knapp. Patrick is the Public Lands and Stewardship Coordinator for CLC. He joined CLC with a background in sustainable agriculture and is particularly interested in grassland management and the ways in which land can, land use can promote ecosystem function and health. Um, our second speaker this evening is Brandon Dale. Can, you guys can wave so people know who you are. Um, Brandon grew up with hunting and fishing traditions that were passed down in his family in South Louisiana. He is an avid hunter of waterfowl, turkey, deer, small game, and fly fishing and is a fly fishing guide. Now living in New York City for graduate and medical school, he finds solace in the woods and waters of the Hudson Valley, Southern Connecticut, the Catskills, and Long Island. He is the New York ambassador for Hunters of Color, board member for the New York Backcountry Hunters and Aglers, vice president of the New York City Trout Unlimited and Region 2 representative for the New York State Conservation Fund Advisory Board. Brandon is committed to conserving and passing along the traditions of the land, especially for underrepresented hunters and, and anglers. As a New York City resident, he's passionate about increasing hunting and fishing access and opportunity for folks living in urban areas and building community among New York City and the tri-state area while also improving and protecting our public lands and waters. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to pass the, pre the presentation over to our speakers for the evening. Again, please feel free to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your bar. And with that, Pat, please take us away. Thanks, Mallory. Um, and thanks, Brandon, for joining me here. And thanks to everyone else who's joined. Um, I'm, I'm a little uncharacteristically nervous looking at all of these names. Um, there's a lot of people here that I admire, um, you know, biologists, botanists, uh, presidents, past and present of CLC. Uh, <laughs> and um, I'm really looking forward to the Q&A section later on so that um, I can hear all those voices. Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, I'm none of those things. Maybe future president of CLC, don't tell Troy. Uh, but um, I have always, before CLC, I've been a farmer. Um, I've always worked outdoors and um, 
I've enjoyed being part of my ecosystems. Um, I've, I've managed grasslands primarily. And my favorite tool for optimizing the health and um, enhancing the, the effectiveness for, uh, of grasslands for how the services they could provide to humans. My favorite tool has always been livestock, specifically cattle. Um, now in this role, I continue to do that. Um, we lease some of our grasslands to, to other like-minded farmers who are doing a great job stewarding those lands. Um, but I'm also um, working with some, some landscapes that are a little bit newer to me, such as forests. I'm lucky to work with a lot of really smart people, uh, experts, and volunteers, passionate outdoors people um, who have provided me uh, a quick education in um, identifying a healthy forest, the characteristics of a healthy forest and um, nurturing uh, these forests despite the, the threats and challenges. Um, I have, through that, I've, I've kind of become more friendly with my new favorite tool for promoting forest health, um, which is a really great community of hunters. Um, so DLC's mission is on the screen here. Um, the Columbia Land Conservancy brings people together to conserve, appreciate, and enjoy land. CLC owns over 4,000 acres of land in Columbia County. 10 properties are, are public and um, on them there's 30 miles of trail and we've seen as many as 45,000 visits per year to these properties. So my job on the as, as part of the team that manages these uh, public lands is to protect and preserve the natural, recreational, educational, and agricultural resources. Um, one of the things that's been really exciting for me with CLC is um, embarking on new projects that um, puts CLC on the forefront as uh, a model landowner in Columbia County and engaging with other land managers and land users um, to share our successes and struggles and, and um, the story of how we have been managing this land. Um, to balance recreation and conservation values, is sometimes a zero sum game. Um, if if we're talking about um, citing a new parking area or something like that. Um, but in the case of our discussion today, um, the recreational hunting um, is really just like a match made in heaven uh, with, with conservation. Um, I'll have Mallory go to the next slide to talk about uh, the characteristics of a healthy forest. So um, a healthy forest is diverse. Um, and when we talk about biodiversity, we're talking soil to canopy. We're talking, um, we're talking about insects, native plants, um, birds, pollinators, fungi, and a healthy forest can include deer. Um, a healthy forest has an ability to perform ecosystem services, such as uh, filtering water, sequestering carbon. It has an ability to adapt with climate change and it has an ability to regenerate. Um, when I talk about regeneration, we're talking about um, a disturbance to a forest, could be natural or man-made, and in order to regenerate, there needs to be a forest succession uh, intact. So we're talking about trees of different species, of different ages, of different heights, um, in order to fill the gaps. Uh, lastly, I would say that a, a healthy forest can be a working landscape. It can sustain long-term economic benefits to its stewards if its stewards are um, approaching that task uh, with reciprocity in mind. 
Mally, I'll have you go to the next slide. So those traits of a healthy forest are essentially um, all of these things. There's more, but it's a lot of the things that we enjoy about forests. And a lot of the reasons why CLC's mission is to, in part, protect these forests. Now, the biggest threat to the forests and, and these characteristics that I mentioned before, increasingly uh, is an overpopulation of white-tailed deer. We're currently experiencing um, a historic population size of white-tailed deer. And I think it's important to say here that, you know, 100 years ago or so, white-tailed deer were hunted almost to extinction. Um, that was around the time that a lot of the forests that we appreciate now were given a chance to grow above the deer browse line and get to the age that we see them now. Um, and it's been actually like a, a conservation success story to get the deer population um, back to a healthy level. And now we've moved beyond that to where they are pests. So um, this is sometimes where we find disagreement because when we talk about the carrying capacity of the land, in terms of white-tailed deer, there's a difference in the carrying capacity to support recreational hunting, where sometimes the goal is to improve the quality of the bucks and the carrying capacity to support an ecologically diverse and healthy forest. And I'd argue that um, the carrying capacity for uh, a healthy forest is actually well lower than the carrying capacity to support, um, you know, these trophy bucks. So um, how do we measure deer populations if not by uh, the encounters with trophy bucks? Uh, you could count deer. I know Cary Institute's been uh, having success in monitoring their forests with spotlights. You can um, track vehicle collisions in an area, which is an interesting way to monitor deer. Um, and I think that HIT shows another maybe unintended consequences of such a high population of deer. You can track permitted deer harvests in an area. So whether that's um, DEC tracking that or uh, on CLC's land, we uh, looked to hunters to help us keep monitor deer populations through um, reporting their harvest at the end of a hunting season. Um, but probably the most impactful way to really understand the deer population is to try to measure the impact that they're having within a forest. So um, right now, CLC is using a tool called AVID, which is uh, assessing vegetation impact by deer. It has its flaws, but um, New York State is suggesting that this is currently our best method for measuring deer impact. So we're following their lead and um, we're counting deer that way for now. Um, the way that we do that is essentially by just setting up plots within a forest and um, we, mon we try to monitor each plot at the same time each year and observe the impact by deer on any um, flower, sapling, um, shrub, tree in that little plot. So this is something we do with volunteers. And what we're seeing is pretty dire. And there's a real uh, urgency here to correct this if we want to see um, a forest succession. So uh, AVID will break down forests as having uh, no impact by deer, low impact, moderate, high, or very high impact by deer. Um, I would say no impact only exists behind a deer exposure or an orchard fence um, or in other areas where there's a natural barrier 
such as a uh, um, af after a real wind event or something, and there's uh, enough trees on the ground that it makes it hard for deer to walk around on the forest floor. Low impact, you'll start to see um, plants that are more palatable to deer are, are starting to be affected and their growth is limited. So that might be some wildflower species um, and preferred tree seedlings. And then we see moderate impacts as um, there's real obvious signs of deer browse to seedlings or understory plants. And I would say moderate to very high is pretty much where we're at right now on CLC properties. So high impact, uh, you might see, you might see tall trees with a canopy and then everything underneath is deer resistant ferns or, um, or an understory that's dominated um, by tree species that are less preferred by deer. Um, I've seen, you know, like hop horn beans pop up um, or another sign of high impact is a browse line, which is a visual line. You can sometimes see it from the middle of a field. It looks like everything six feet or higher has, or six feet or lower has been um, browsed. And then a very high impact could look like a park-like understory um, with little vegetation. Um, or an understory dominated by invasive shrubs. And that I think of, uh, I grew up in Dutchess County and uh, kind of those areas and further south in Westchester County, uh, it is hard to find a forest with an understory that's not barberry or stilt grass or um, another invasive shrub, which really paints a bleak picture for um, forest succession. I, you start to imagine um, after some sort of event or when the trees kind of reach the end of their lives, you start to picture just a sea of invasive shrubland. Um, so again, we are at a time where this has become urgent. Um, dire for us to address. So how I want to go to the next slide is to talk about how we manage a CLC for uh, a healthy deer population. There are a few methods uh, other than hunting. There's, there's fencing and deer exclosures. These can be expensive. They can be hard to maintain. Um, they can provide barriers for other animals that we hope to see migrating through. Uh, another method would be sterilization, which is costly, um, ethically questionable, and likely there's other unintended consequences um, of that kind of project. There's an, another method of reintroducing predators, which gets talked about a lot. Um, I, I love seeing predators in our landscape. I think um, reintroducing predators is a great thing, but um, it will come with other social and economic costs. Wolves and mountain lions could become, well, they would become a threat to livestock and um, livestock producers are already having a pretty hard time making a living in this region, I'd say. Um, it's unlikely that predators can be reintroduced at a scale to really make an impact on deer population. But what we can do is recognize humans as apex predators in this ecosystem. Um, there's a tradition on this land um, dating back before European settlers of humans um, uh, being able to shape the deer population to a he healthy level by considering venison a, a staple as a diet in, in your diet. Um, and I think it would take a lot to, to get back to that as a culture, but we're seeing in our forests the need to, um, 
start hunting at an impactful scale. They're outside of like this cultural barrier to hunting at that scale of um, venison not really being part of everyone's diet. Um, there's obviously some some hearts and minds that need to be uh, won over by the non-hunting public. Um, I think the movie Bambi kind of did some damage there, but um, <laughs> uh, but I think understanding the urgency and the importance of humans reestablishing themselves in the role of predator and the benefits of harvesting more deer of either sex and seeing more venison in our food system can kind of outweigh uh, some of the squeamishness around um, hunting Bambi. Uh, when, when you think about the um, sustainability and, and venison as a healthy protein source, um, this is something that I've like, as a beef producer, always kind of aimed for is being able to produce beef at such in, in such a sustainable way as venison is currently, um, you know, putting putting protein into into people's bellies. And I think that there's a real impactful solution here um, for issues of food justice and and food miles, food sovereignty um, issues that are. Uh, discuss the other community conversations, plug, feel free to join. Um, there's also, back to barriers of hunting at scale, there's a um, not just the hearts and minds of the non-hunting public need to be won over, but I think that there are um, some hunters that are going to need to be brought on board. So um, one thing that I see is a false sense of scarcity um, or maybe even territorialness when it comes to accessing land to hunt. Um, this sometimes prevents landowners from wanting to engage in allowing hunting on their land. It prevents new folks from wanting to involve themselves in hunting. Um, and obviously it, prevents hunting at an impactful scale. So um, CLC has always prioritized hunting on properties where it's safe and appropriate to do so. And it's become um, more and more of a goal to be as inclusive as we can and really build a community around um, our hunters uh, that, that hunt our permitted areas. Um, the last... Um, barrier to hunting at, at an impactful scale that I want to talk about is a lack of incentive for hunters. Um, right now it's illegal to sell wild game that you've harvested. And that's something that I think we would like to see change in order to give more folks an opportunity to make a living off the land, um, even in small ways. So, um, what you're looking at now is a map of Overmountain Conservation Area. Um, starting in the 2023, this past season, CLC started using this app picture here. It's called Hunt Stand. Um, and this is to allow hunters to reserve hunt areas, uh, better understand who they're sharing the property with, and see useful information such as um, property boundaries and trails. So going into the fall, CLC bought 40 licenses uh, to, to give out, to issue to our hunters for free. Um, this was mostly a big thank you for bearing with us as we tried a new technology. Um, but <clears throat> we, had no wait list this year. So um, previous years we've capped hunting at around 40 hunters. And this year, um, all 79 people who applied received a permit. And at that point, um, they had to reserve stands and hunt stand before they went out hunting. So what you're looking at here is roughly um, <clears throat> 30 acre, 40 acre or more um, areas that are divided out. There's no 
lines on the trees or anything when you go out there. This is, you'll have to use the app to see these lines. And there's no actual tree stands where each of those markers are, but that's, that's just a feature so that folks can reserve an area in the same way that you would reserve a parking spot or an Airbnb um, without double booking. So um, the problem that I felt that this was solving was in the past, we were allowing um, 17 hunting permits for all of over Mountain, which is a 1700 acre property. So um, even, even if you take out the areas where we felt it was unsafe to allow hunting uh, so close to trails and houses and the road, I'd still say that was pretty uh, understocked with hunters, but we didn't have a better way of knowing how many of those hunters were out at any given time. So, um, you know, maybe on opening day of, of deer season, um, all 17 of those hunters were out, but then I think it was probably pretty rare that more than two hunters were using the property at once. Um, but we don't, we don't really know. And now we do have a better sense. So, um, again, in 2022, we issued 17 hunting permits and five, uh, harvests were reported. And in 2023, um, 40 permitted hunters made reservations to hunt at over mountain. That's out of the 79 that, uh, had permits across the three PCAs and, um, 14 deer were harvested. So, that number still feels like a drop in the bucket to me. We're hoping that more har harvest reports roll in from people who might have harvested and forgot to email me. Um, so if any of you out there are hunters that forgot to email me, please do. Um, but yeah, we're hoping to engage with more hunters to, to spend more time out there and harvest more deer and make, make a real impactful difference. So, I wanted to um, mention a few things that all of you could do uh, if you wanted to be part of this program. Um, you could volunteer to monitor impact. Um, we have trainings to um, monitor these AVID plots that we've set up. And that goes into uh, decisions on how we manage uh, the hunt program for the land. You could um, hunt. Whether you know how to hunt or you want to learn how to hunt, we hope to have um, opportunities for all of you in the future. Um, you could mentor beginning hunters and you could donate. Um, so before um, I hand this over to Brandon, I just want to... Um, I, I just want to say uh, how great it has been to work with him. And um, uh, I'm excited for all of you to hear him speak. He's, he's charismatic. He's excited about this work. He loves to hunt. Uh, he gives so much of himself to bring people in and to enjoy the land together. And he embodies this re reciprocity when it comes to nurturing ecosystems for a small return. Um, and uh, I also wanted to mention or, or bring up CLC's um, commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion in this space and in all the work that we do. So I'm going to quickly read. Um, for, nor for nearly 40 years, CLC has brought people together to conserve, appreciate, and enjoy land in order to achieve that mission more fully and for the next 40 years. We need to reckon with the history of conservation. We need to shape a new future by seeking out those who have been excluded from connecting with the land, shaping what conservation means and moving forward with values-driven intention. We value including many voices and perspectives, learning from the past and preparing for the future. And we value the belief that accessing land is a right that everyone deserves. Um, and. I think it's important to, to note that in doing this work, in, in really committing to this work, there might be sacrifices um, in what Brandon's about to talk about. CLCs have to make very few sacrifices. We let a handful of folks hunt turkeys and camp overnight at Over Mountain, two things that we historically haven't allowed at the properties that 
CLC owns. Um, but it was it was an easy yes. And for this, we were able to see our community of conservationists expand and um, see new folks that were introduced to over mountain, in some cases introduced to hunting and camping, and they were able to um, gain an intimate experience with the outdoors. And that's exactly what CLC is hoping to foster. Awesome. Thank you so much, Patrick. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. It's been really great working with you and Troy and everyone else from CLC as well. You all have been so, so gracious uh, to both work with us, but then also just to be really good partners, I think, and sort of making sure that, uh, you know, the outdoors really are for everyone. And so, hey to everyone. Uh, I'm going to speak pretty quickly, try to get through some of these slides, because uh, I really want to have a conversation. Um, but uh, I am going to briefly talk about uh, sort of what it is at Hunters of Color that we do and sort of uh, how our programs look and also like what the purpose of, of sort of having a dedicated community for bringing more people, especially people of color and communities of color in the outdoors in New York State. Uh, just a brief touch point. These are some of our programs that we've had over the past uh, this year. So on the far right was actually our first turkey camp at Over Mountain at Columbia County, uh, where we had four mentees paired for the very first time turkey hunting, first time camping. Uh, out at Over Mountain. We've also done a deer hunt with the Nature Conservancy, another conservancy we were very closely with. And then we also had like a large sort of introductory archery day uh, where we basically charter a bus that brings people up from the city to sort of get out on a preserve at Westchester and learn how to shoot archery. So uh, the entire focus of HOC, if you want to go to the next slide, Mallory. Um, here, okay, actually, I'll skip this. Basically, we did the intro already. Uh, yeah, and then, yeah, so the entire purpose of uh, HOC is really to create an accessible and, and equitable space in which you can bring more people who don't traditionally see themselves represented in the outdoors, and also not as necessarily being someone who feels that they are responsible for the outdoors because they don't see themselves as stakeholders in our conservation. Uh, and that's traditionally because they've not been included in that space. And so really, uh, HOC started uh, three years ago, and it's been really amazing to see the growth of this organization. It started out in the West Coast. Uh, and I'm just the ambassador for New York State. And so I'm in charge of like running and sort of coordinating programming here in the state. But um, it's been really, really amazing to see just how much this organization has grown, especially as, given the fact that it's a very small organization. It's a nonprofit. I'm a volunteer and all of our other ambassadors are also volunteers. And really the vision of why HSC was created was that we could start to start to, as Patrick mentioned, increase the slice of the pie of people who are actively involved in conservation. And as someone who grew up hunting, uh, you know, from a family tradition, like my uncle was a game warden for 15 years. My other uncle was a professional bass fisherman. I had farmers on both sides of my family. Uh, I think that like I grew up with this exposure to the landscape and this sort of natural reciprocity of like, we're going to eat wild game and have like wild game dinners and like bring sausage that my grandmother taught me how to make uh, two different potlucks and things in nature. And I think all of those things I really took for granted, I think, whenever I was growing up. Uh, and when I moved up to New England for college and now graduate school, I continued to do those things and continued to hunt and fish. And uh, I think it was really an amazing opportunity whenever I was partnered up with HOC and heard about it in its first year and got to participate as a mentor in the program and really see just like how hungry I think people are for experiences. Uh, and without sort of uh, once you remove those obstacles for people, um, it's really amazing to see the, the trajectories of so many mentees who have been throughout our programming change and mentors like um, I'll talk more about that uh, later on. But um, yeah, so anyway, the back to the vision, it really is the focus on trying to eventually create an outdoor community of conservationists and hunters that are essentially centered and mirror what we see demographically and proportionally in our demographics of the country. And so if you want to go to the next slide, Mallory. I'm going to do, uh, yeah, so a couple of it, a little bit more about why HRC exists. Again, expanding and sustaining conservation efforts. I'll talk a little bit about our North American wildlife model of conservation, which I think is the bedrock. And for a lot of people who either don't hunt or don't really know like how conservation is funded in the States or in general, just like conservation uh, funding mechanisms in, in the U.S., uh, this is kind of the bedrock to, that ties why hunters specifically, um, you know, and anglers are actually those that are in a very dramatic way, like sustaining and funding our conservation efforts in the United States. Um, second, obviously protecting traditions and cultures. A lot of folks from all over our programming 
um, all come from historical heritages that have sort of deep and rich cultures of hunting and fishing um, and like living in reciprocity with the landscape that oftentimes people have been removed from, right? Whenever you move to a giant city and your family members stop hunting because it's better or easier to go to the grocery store. And, you know, instead of having to do all the things that you would traditionally have done, um, that gets lost. And so I think a big part of this is also really connecting people back to a culture and sort of a heritage that uh, was lost. I think another huge aspect is community building. We really focus on community. I think if you ask any hunter on this call, and hopefully we can have a conversation about it, how they started hunting, I can almost guarantee that probably 80% of the people on this call who started hunting as a kid, no, 95% of the people who started hunting as a kid will say, oh, I had a family member or an uncle or, you know, generally some like male like figure in their family traditionally who would have done this and taught them how to hunt. And I think that like that demographic and that story, like that's how I started. My like grandfather and uncle and things of the nature brought me out. My mom was a big part of it later in my life. But I think um, that narrative, I think, is changing. And a lot of the recruitment and sort of like activation efforts that have been done with the hunting community at large uh, generally are not necessarily addressing what happens when you don't have that community or that exposure first. And so like recreating that family unit, that community, that trust uh, is really important, especially for communities of color that might necessarily not feel welcome in the outdoors. And so I think a big part of that is meeting an unmet need. Uh, like every program that we run, we always have way more people apply and interested in attending than we have either resources, capacity, or actual spots. Uh, and I think that's just a testament of how many people really just want to connect and be involved in this sort of uh, landscape of like living a life that is connected to the land through hunting and, and sort of connected in reciprocity with conservation as well. And, and lastly, there are obviously health benefits, um, as Patrick had mentioned extensively about the sort of food aspects. Uh, but then also, I think just like to hunt is hard. And I think also like a lot of people who come through our programming see that like, oh, my gosh, like I spent like 48 hours sitting in a tree stand. I haven't seen anything, um, <laughs> but they love it. And I love it. And it's like one of those things that you just begin to sort of start to see the benefits, uh, obviously beyond a kill or a harvest. But I think that that is, uh, you know, there, this is just one of, of many benefits that come from, from hunting, but heading to the next slide, Mallory. Um, so back, oh, sorry. So, uh, briefly hunters of color 2023 this past year. So this is inclusive of all of the sort of hunters of color programming. That's not just across New York state. This is also, uh, in California, Oregon, and uh, I think it's like 13 now, new states that we're in. Um, 15 states, but basically we've hosted, uh, 42 events, uh, with greater than three, 1300, 1300 people impacted. And here in New York state, I think that number is closer to around 300, uh, for programming last year. And that number is going to continue to grow, which has been really great to see the support, um, from all mentors who are on the call, which is really great. And mentees who continually show up to these wild adventures. Um, <laughs> uh, if you can go to the next slide, Mallory. Um, so again, basically the sort of group of people who we serve is really anyone who wants to help make the outdoors for everyone. I think a big part of this is that, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we focus a lot on community and I think community is a bedrock of why we can do these programmings because we have so many people who are so dedicated to the idea that, uh, they want people to have experiences in learning how to sort of like hunt and how to be in connection with the land. Um, and they view it as important that like it's not that it's not excluded from any one group of uh, or, or people based off of any any sort of uh, preset criteria. And so, again, we work with mentors, anyone who wants to be a mentor uh, and pass along their passion for hunting and fishing and willing to practice anti-racism, uh, mentees, any BIPOC, BIPOC folks who want to learn how to hunt and again, volunteers as well. So if you're at all a hunter and you want to be a mentor or if you know someone who wants to be a mentee or you yourself want to be a mentee, reach out after this call. If you go to the next slide, Mallory. Okay, so I'm going to try to go through this pretty quickly. Um, and so this is the model, the sort of seven pillars of our North American model for wildlife conservation. I'm not going to read uh, all these here. I'm actually going to jump to the next slide. Um, however, uh, I highly recommend everyone go and read through it and actually look at those seven pillars because that really lays the bedrock for how uh, we fund organizations like, you know, any sort of land conservancy, our Federal Bureau of Wildlife, Game and Fish, um, basically anything in conservation, you name it, all of our conservation fund advisory boards across the state um, basically have some portion of their funding that actually comes from uh, hunters and anglers. And so a pit that I'm going to focus on here is uh, basically this particular cycle. And so um, for those who aren't hunters and maybe those who or, or, or anglers who don't know, and those who are anglers and hunters don't know, uh, basically the Pittman-Robertson Act and the Dingle-Johnson Act are two of the sort of important, um, basically like 
conservation taxes essentially that are applied specifically to hunters and anglers exclusively. And so what happens is whenever I go to the store and buy ammunition or I buy hooks or I buy, uh, you know, like any sort of archery equipment or broadheads, anything relating to hunting, fishing, or I buy a duck stamp or I buy a habitat stamp or anything relating to that, my dollar as spending that here in New York state, like when I buy a hunting license, literally stays a certain percent of it in New York state and basically allocates a certain percentage from the federal conservation fund that then gets reallocated to my state, which eventually makes its way back to DEC, which eventually makes its way down to other land conservancies and projects and biologists who are doing the on the ground sort of work. And so in a very real way, um, the more people who we have paying into the system and actually buying into the idea that we're going to continue to support and sustain our conservation model, um, the better, obviously, the, the better we can do for maintaining and sort of preserving um, our habitats. And I think a big part of what I focus on is really this recruitment to get more people into this field, especially um, given, next slide, please, Mallory. Uh, especially given the sort of shrinking swath of the hunters over the cross uh, of the pa of the past 50 years. And so I'm not going to go through all of these numbers, but uh, the general takeaway is that hunters are a dying population. Uh, and at large, if you were to continue out the trend uh, and not have the tide turned of who's coming into hunting or how we're recruiting people into hunting, um, we as like a hunter population um, and our like pretty large chunk of funding would also dry up. And so one of the big pieces of why I think this work is so important is because we are really tapping into and reactivating and, and, and really beginning the activation energy for a lot of people who didn't normally see themselves as having ownership or even like a role in managing and sort of contributing and protecting our sort of future of uh, these resources that we all love to enjoy. And so I think a big part of this is like, obviously hunting is is the core of what we're here to talk about, but all of these pictures down here are examples of conservation projects that we've worked on in the past year with HOC and collaborations also with BHA and Trout Unlimited and other groups. Um, as much as I talk and love about hunting and fishing, um, I obviously love the fact that like I wake up every day and I know that those resources are gonna be here at least for tomorrow. And I think the fact that like, uh, that might not be the case in 50 years if we don't continue to re-engage more people to continue that uh, is really scary. And so I think that's something that like gives me a lot of energy in this work. And I know I have a lot of amazing mentors uh, and mentees here who feel the same way. And so if you go to the next slide, Mallory, um, a little bit about programming. So uh, yeah, I'd mentioned some of the numbers, but um, we do a pretty wide range of programming, all focused on basically having people enter into the HOC community um, with sort of year one being your sort of introduction to deer hunting, just because of the fact that one deer is like a great conservation at goal, as, as Patrick had mentioned, there's a, there's a very clear line of deer hunting, uh, and conservation, I think for a lot of people. Uh, and while I would argue though, that all hunting is conservation, even non deer species. And I think that's actually something that would love to talk about more in the Q and a, um, because I think so many other types of species and game give you so much more variety to be on the landscape and to like, know, oh, this is like a perennial that I only see in the spring that like is popping up that I would not know is like, oh, in, in, under threat, et cetera. Uh, but anyway. I think there are a lot of benefits of having a diversity of experience within hunting. And the idea is that after coming through programming from one year and going through three years of programming where people do an introductory crossbow hunt with deer, they uh, then sort of graduate to vertical bow hunting with deer. And then sort of the third year is that they become a mentor uh, and sort of sprinkled in that is other opportunities to hunt turkeys, to hunt small game, waterfowl, squirrels, et cetera, uh, all while also building on this idea that conservation uh, is sort of at the core of what we should be doing and trying to educate like and, and, and sort of grow in the community ethos of everyone who comes to the program is hopefully going to be able to take skills and, and sort of a framework and pass that along to people within their own communities. And so it really is sort of like um, a pyramid scheme, I guess, where we hopefully hope that one person who comes to our program uh, is going to spread this to like 30 other people who continues to pipeline this out. And so if you could go to the next slide, Mallory. Um, we've been really, really thankful that we've been able to do a lot of cool opportunities to collaborate with New York DEC. Um, this was an article which I'd recommend everyone check out, The Conservationist, uh, Creating New Conservationists Through Turkey Hunting, which really outlines a lot of what I was talking about beforehand, how I think uh, hunting in general, I think provides a framework in which you can engage on the landscape. And I think deer, as we can talk about more, is a great opportunity to sort of see that in a very direct way. Um, but I think it's all hunting. And if you go to the next slide, Mallory, um, I will wrap up and we can get to the Q&A. And yes, looking forward to speaking with all of you. Thanks so much. Wow, yeah, we can just give a virtual round of applause to Brandon and, and Pat. Thank you so much for sharing 
all of that information and your wisdom and your experiences. I really appreciate it. Um, we have a few questions that have already come into the chat, um, but just to give a refresher to folks who might be new joining us, um, on the bottom of everyone's screen, there's a function that says Q&A. If you click on that button, um, you can type in a question and we will put it in the queue to ask our presenters. Um, so the first question that I wanted to open up to both Patrick and Brandon um, is how has your relationship with hunting evolved since beginning with your respective organizations? I can go first. Um, I've managed land for a long time and uh, um, I, no matter where I've managed land, there's always been hunters present. And there have been times, especially when I was um, younger, where managing them was my least favorite part of the year, probably. Uh, and I was dealing with conflicts um, in the woods. Again, coming back to this like false sense of scarcity and territorialness. And... I think that I also had not enough of an education around hunting to both realize um, the safety concerns that I had were probably overblown and um, I didn't realize how crucial ex exactly the the job of hunters was to what what we were all trying to accomplish. So with CLC, that's clearly changed quite a bit. I, I really value my time working with hunters. I'm trying to build this community out. And um, and I think that they're playing an invaluable role on our and doing really good, hard work. I think I think for me, I'll echo that. I think uh like whenever, you know, I, I hunted, like, as I said, after I left Louisiana, like through college and, and grad school as well. But it wasn't for like the first two years that like I was in New York City that I ever really told like anyone who wasn't my roommates that like, oh, like I have like three deer in my deep freezer that I've also got a deep freezer in my apartment. Uh, and I think that was a big part of it because I think that I wasn't ready, I think, at the time to have conversations uh, that go beyond the surface of like hunting is bad, killing animals is bad, which... I think when you really probe down to that, I think that now it's like, I really can't go anywhere and not talk about hunting um, or, or fishing. And I think that uh, I've been really, really thankful because I feel like the sort of work of transitioning more into like the sort of like education and community building and really just like debunking a lot of the sort of oftentimes like myths around hunting and around how conservation happens and like where our food comes from um, has, it, has provided like really rich conversations and really rich, just like opportunities to think and like reflect on my own, like growth, both as a hunter. Um, but also like, I see myself somewhat as like an educator and like someone who's like also doing work to sort of make sure that we're like, just like, like educating people correctly in like how to navigate a world where you have people who don't hunt, but eat meat, or, you know, maybe don't know how they feel about hunting, but would be interested, uh, or who have like been hunting forever, but maybe don't like, you know, certain aspects of hunting, etc. And I think being able to like navigate that has been really, really fun, because I feel like it's been a great opportunity to learn how to like really talk about issues that are like important and impacting the hunting community while also bringing more people in. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, this is a question for both of you, um, and kind of goes back to Pat's um, presentation. We have a question here from Kate asking, how many deer per square mile um, you might consider, quote unquote, healthy on an ecological level? I know that's specific, um, but if either of you have an answer to speak to gauging that number or that population size. I would love to pass this question to Fred because I just heard him answer this question very well the other day. Um, and for those that don't know, Fry is the president at CLC. I'll, I'll try to text Pat an extra so he didn't let me do that. So but uh, it, so it really depends on where you are. Uh, well, one, it's it's hard to pinpoint an exact number of deer per square mile in any one area. I don't think there is any right answer. 
as you here in Columbia County, as you get closer to the river and we have more ag lands available, then the, the area can support more deer. As you head towards the Taconics uh, and you have larger forested block areas, uh, those areas are gonna support less deer if they're not directly adjacent to ag lands. So it really depends on food access for the deer. And uh, the more food they have, and ag lands provide great opportunities, as a lot of the farmers will tell you, for the deer to eat, uh, the more deer that can be supported in that area. Wonderful. Thank you, Troy. All right. So I, we have another question here that, um, Pat, you had mentioned when you were speaking that deer could be considered a pest. And they're wondering, um, would coyotes also be considered a pest? I almost want to, I can try again, but I'll, I can, I can do this one, Troy. Um, <laughs> Troy and I uh, have similar feelings on coyotes and predators. Um, we are, I don't think we're anywhere near uh, a pest level with coyotes as we are with deer. I think that um, efforts to eradicate coyotes have been kind of hilariously futile. Um, they they come back with a vengeance. They um, There's a really great book called Coyote America that I talk about like once a week. Uh, and, and there's a lot of information in there, but in, included in it is how how failed this effort to uh, eradicate uh, coyotes has been. Uh, and I think that that's a great thing. I think I think it's great to have coyotes in our forests and in our farmland and um, probably not in our cities, but they love being near people. Thank you, Pat. This next one I'm going to pass to, to Brandon. Um, and so you talked a lot about the converse, conservation model um, and one person didn't hear any mention of trapping. So is there a role for respectful, responsible trapping in the conservation model? Yeah, that's a great question. And one that I will have to do some digging on, but I would be very surprised if like trapping equipment. So like foothold traps and scents and lures and things of nature you would purchase from usually like a fish, like a hunting shop. I would be very surprised if that was excluded from that fund, but I don't know. And I think the one piece of reservation that I have for that too, is that I would also not be surprised if maybe there was a separate sort of act. So I know hunting, fishing, Dingle Donson has its equivalent, Pittman Robertson for hunting and shooting sports. Um, I would not be surprised if maybe there's a different sort of piece of like taxable legislation that contributes from that fund. I also know when you buy a trapper's license, like I'm sure that there is some amount sequestered for trapper education, but I don't know that for sure. Um, but I definitely think trapping is also like, uh, like within the framework of hunting, I think of trapping. I myself am not a trapper yet, would love to, but not the time, but it looks awesome. And I think that, um, you know, I think trappers know the landscape even better than hunters, right? Like they're on there every single day um by necessity and i think um you know trapping is i think an even more sort of like publicly facing conservation to controversial topic but um i would argue that it's probably way more effective at actually managing pop like animals at a population level um than hunting as an individual sitting and logging hours in a stand removing maybe one deer from the landscape or three max in a season uh, I think trappers do a lot better job at understanding population dynamics and actually being able to like do something on that front. So uh, I definitely think there's a role for trapping. Fantastic. Thank you, Brandon. Um, we have two questions in the Q&A wondering, um, I'm reading them as more specific to CLC, but Brandon, please chime in here as well. Um, looking for recommendations for landowners who are considering allowing access to their, to their property by hunters. So what steps might folks take? Is there an avenue that they can walk with you, Pat, Troy, Brandon, um, to make that possible? I would say whoever asked that question to definitely reach out directly um, to CLC, to me or Troy. Um, we're trying to build this network and um, provide more opportunities to do some matchmaking uh, among hunters and landowners. So, um, yeah, that's definitely a role that CLC is hoping to play in the 
pretty near future. Yeah, I think similarly, uh, feel free to email me. It's just brandon at huntersofcolor.org. I think they'll send out emails as well. Uh, but yeah, we're always looking for more places because that's more folks, right, who we can just be like, okay, here's this you know, piece of land, uh, we get to like, obviously build a relationship with you, the landowner and the landscape. Uh, I would love to be able to do some conservation projects there as well. And then just actually real quick on the last question about trapping. It's really cool. I had uh, someone who's a mentee who's on the call from one of our hunters of color program uh, was just he lives in Connecticut. And so he was basically involved with the Department of Environmental uh, and the environmental uh, deep, basically deep is their abbreviation. It's the equivalent of DEC. But they treat hunter, trappers and hunters as a single group for funds. He just had a conversation with this about in Connecticut. I would imagine it'd be similar in New York, but very timely. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Brandon. Um, and just to clarify for everyone on the call as well, either tomorrow or Thursday, um, Rebecca and I will be sending out an email that not only has a recording of this call, but will have the PowerPoint slides and contacts for um, Pat and Brandon. So if you're thinking of anything, if you want to reach out to them individually, we'll be sure to provide that contact information to you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And the one that's in the chat is a two-parter. Um, so question one for Pat, um, are there CLC properties that have lower deer impacts that we can visit to see examples of healthier forests? Yes. Um, one property that I'm thinking of because that photo of the trillium in the healthy forests slide uh, was taken at Harris, which is a really um, unique property and relatively healthy deer population um, and, a, and, a, and really low uh, invasive pressure, which I think is a really good um, uh, indicator of that. And um, Troy is texting me that uh, <laughs> we also have a newly acquired property that's adjacent, adjacent to Beatty Hill that um, kind of demonstrates smaller characteristics. Fantastic. Thanks, Pat and Troy. Um, and for our last question of the night, Brandon, um, we have one individual wondering, does Hunters of Color have any intentions slash capacity to do legislative advocacy work to improve the potential of recreational hunting to affect population reductions? Um, that's a great question. I feel like, uh, I guess it would depend. Uh, I feel like that's in line with, I think, a lot of our programming. Like, um, you know, we we always try to sort of tie things back to like obviously some conservation piece, but also like the legislative uh, sort of initiatives that are happening at current. Uh, and this year, actually, we're going to have sort of like a big capstone event where we hopefully will have some of like the electorate uh, down in New York City and basically talk with some of the mentees and mentors. And this is going to be a collaboration with backcountry hunters and anglers uh, and, and a couple of other sort of conservation minded groups. Um, so I think at least in some sort of collaborative capacity, yes. Um, but I think that definitely, uh, would be something that like, I'd be happy to talk about, you know, us like co-signing something, because I think in general, um, it is really, I think the end goal to get people from interested in hunting to, you know, sort of on their own hunting journey, uh, which is, you know, a forever journey, um, uh, but eventually to really take on the title of hunter conservationist is sort of like the full scale scope. And so like what we can do to accelerate people on that pathway, um, is, is ideal. So yeah, definitely would be open to the conversation and other groups as well, like BHA, uh, you know, we're already doing this work and like, would love to sort of get some more support behind it. Wonderful. Well, I just want to extend my deepest thanks to Brandon and Pat for taking some time out of your Tuesday evening to share your knowledge with us. And thank you to everyone else who jumped on a call with us to spend your Tuesday evening and for asking such thoughtful questions. Um, we have our final community conversation for this series. It's going to be on March 5th with a focus on farming and conservation with more details to come. Um, so with that, good night, everyone. I hope you have lovely evenings. Thank you again so much for joining us.